Good evening. Uh, my name's Tim Bradley, and I'm the area director for C.S. Lewis Institute in Loudoun County, Virginia. And it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, uh, Father Tom. And uh, uh, some of you know, may know his, his father from the Institute or his mother from the Institute. They've been long uh, supporters and participants in, in the Institute's work from almost the beginning. Uh, Father Tom is director here at uh, St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Percival, and he is a senior teaching fellow with the Institute. He's been with uh, the Loudoun uh, Institute from our beginning seven years ago, and he sits on our advisory board as well. Uh, he is, uh, has an MDiv from Westminster Theological Seminary and a uh, Doctor of Ministry from Gordon-Conwell. Uh, so this evening, uh, Tom is going to break out the talk into two sections, uh, each of which will go a little less than an hour, uh, and we'll leave questions at the end of each uh, for, for you to ask. So uh, as you have questions, we've got set up this evening for you to email me uh, at t.bradley at cslewisinstitute.org. Uh, and then at the end of the first uh, session, we'll uh, answer those questions that you have. Uh, we'll have a short break between the two sessions of about five minutes, and we, we will shoot to, to uh, complete um, around uh, nine o'clock or so, uh, unless we're, we're really engaged in, in more discussion. So we'll just play it by ear. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Actually, I need those papers. <laughs> Without those, there will be no talk. Thank you, Tim, for my papers. Thank you also for my introduction. It is always good to be with uh, C.S. Lewis Institute fellows and C.S. Lewis Institute events. And uh, I love opportunities to teach. And what I'm talking about tonight is a great subject, the subject of sex. We're talking about sex tonight, lots of sex. It's a seminar on sex. And uh, I'd like to start with a prayer and then a joke. Join me. Almighty and merciful God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations and shape our wills that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you, and then use us, we pray, as you will, in our life of intimacy with others, in our sex lives before you, and with those whom we love. We pray for your protection, your guidance, your provision. And Lord, as we live and work and witness in the United States today, we pray that you will anoint and empower, that you will bless your people with wisdom and clarity and humility, and truth, and love, so that we may model and speak in ways that lead to sexual flourishing and health in our society. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to start tonight talking about our off-color subject with an off-color joke, if I may. When I first heard this, I thought, there's got to be some way I can use that joke in the pulpit. And I think I finally found it. It's a seminar on sex. This is a joke <laughs> to get us started, all right? So um, there were these three ministers, one a Presbyterian, one an Episcopalian, one a Baptist. And they don't go into a bar, no, they get into a car. Every year 
they and their wives pile into a car, they drive to the big city for a Christmas dinner together to celebrate the season. And this particular year, as they drove, they hit this gigantic deer in the road. It smashed the front windshield. They went off through the guardrail, tumbling down the embankment. And then at the bottom of the hill, they burst into flame. They all died. So finding themselves before St. Peter in the pearly gates, you see in the picture here, um, they came up the escalator and presented themselves to St. Peter. And the Episcopal priest and his wife went first, presenting their name and address and his clergy card number. And uh, Peter looked them up in the book and he said, uh, ooh, so sorry to tell you that you're not here. And the Episcopal priest says, well, I've been a faithful minister of word and sacraments. And Peter says, yes, but you had this problem with alcohol. He said, it was so bad that you married a woman named Sherry. So you've just better take the down escalator. So the Presbyterian minister and his wife stepped up next. Name, address, serial number on the clergy card. Peter said the same, sorry. The minister says, but I have held to the Westminster standards. Peter says, yeah, but it says you also had a problem with money. He said, it was so bad, your greed, that you married a woman named Penny. You better just step onto that down escalator. Now, the Baptist pastor who's been watching all this steps up with his wife with this distressed look on his face. He steps up and begins to present his name and address, etc. But then he stops and he just says to his wife, Oh, come on, Fanny. I guess we better get on the down escalator. So we've all got problems in life of one sort or another. And tonight, we're going to address the issue of Fanny. It's a subject that's constantly heard in our society, in the media, entertainment, politics. But it's rarely addressed in the church. So we're going to fix that tonight. All right? And it's not just a social issue out there, but it's, a, it's an issue for most people on a very deeply personal level as well. It's an issue that touches our most precious and often our most painful relationships. And in society, it's a, it's a battleground, titanic scale of ferocity. So what I'd like to do tonight is touch on these different levels, starting with sex as a societal issue, okay? Now, Pat Benatar sang in 1983 that love is a battlefield. And behind those culture wars is a clash of visions that are ruled apart. How much of the culture war would you say revolves around issues of sex? I'd say the lion's share. It is a battlefield. And behind that battle are two visions of human life and sexuality that are worlds apart. On the one hand is the traditional view. Human identity and purpose and truth are formed outside of a person by uh, things that are much bigger than a person. So you receive these things. On the other hand is a postmodern view, which says a person looks inside for these things, for identity, for purpose, for truth, these things are self-created, self-defined. And we're going to look briefly, to begin with, at each, all right, and, the, and how they play out in our culture wars today. All right, so the traditional view, also known as Judeo-Christian view, has been received in the ancient pages of Scripture. It's been refined in Western philosophy for the last 2,000 years with a ton of influence from Greece and Rome, the classics. It's a view of human beings 
that I think was most memorably distilled in the Declaration of Independence. All right? You recognize these words? Highlighted in yellow? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. All right, so notice a few things here. First, we are created by God. We are not self-created. We have certain unchangeable, or in the words of Thomas Jefferson, unalienable qualities and characteristics. There are certain things that are fixed about human beings. Third, we hold these truths. It's not an individual assertion. It's a, these are truths that are held together in common society. They exist outside of ourselves, and we are participants in them with others through reasoned discourse rooted in philosophical and scriptural and scientific study. This is the way Western civilization has, off, has, has operated more or less for centuries. And the goal in this view of human life is to bring my inner world churning and tumultuous and ever-changing as it is, into harmony with this outer world that exists outside of ourselves. The postmodern view, on the other hand, also known as expressive individualism, asserts that truth is individually constructed and discovered most authentically, how? Through what I feel. There's my truth, there's your truth, and we express these things individually and we participate together only through conversation in which we just share our truths in a non-judgmental fashion. And Supreme Court, Anthony, Supreme Court Justice Anthony uh, Kennedy summarized it, I think, best in... Um, 1992, writing the court's opinion in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. He said, at the heart of liberty, the very heart of liberty, is the right to define one's own concept of existence, meaning of the universe, and the mystery of life. Notice, the idea that human identity and purpose are self-created. They are entirely subject to one's own right to define everything. Truth is internal, not external. In this vision, the outer world must be made to conform to my inner world. Or as Bruce Jenner said, call me Caitlin. Now the implications of each of these views are huge for the battlefield of human sexuality. If a person's highest purpose is to express oneself, to be myself, and to act on one's own personal, individual feelings and intuition, then all other obligations and institutions will be subordinated to individual self-expression. There are potentially as many forms of sexual experience and inclination and identity as there are individuals. And these are to be valued over the restraints of monogamy, the responsibilities of parenting, the life of children, they are to be valued even over one's own biological gender, which is like written on every cell of the body. Herbert Mercuse called it polymorphous sexuality, 
and it has gone viral since the 1960s. It started with celebrities and artists and revolutionaries, intellectuals, but it has spread rapidly through the wider population in the last 60, 70 years. In the age of the COVID pandemic, I think this polymorphous pandemic has been far more viral and has spread with more devastating effects all around us. So now, the, so now most institutions of society are enlisted or coerced into creating safe spaces within which everyone can express themselves fully without any limitation or question. You just have to bend to whatever anyone wants to say about themselves. And though this, this approach promises to liberate and to satisfy individuals, I think we're gonna see that polymorphous sexuality leaves hearts empty, it leaves families broken, it leaves the social fabric frayed and polarized. Now in contrast, the traditional vision, which is with this hand, right? This is my traditional vision. The traditional vision speaks of ordered love, which in the Christian tradition seeks to be self-giving, focused on the needs of others. That's how this is supposed to work in the traditional vision. Our personal sexual desires are to be channeled into the safe space of a marriage for the fulfillment of our spouse, for the stable raising of our children, and the betterment of our society. These institutions are enshrined in the traditional vision, and sexual exploration outside of that is discouraged for the common good. This summarizes the difference. So, having painted with broad brush strokes the basic outline of our talk and of the clash that we're addressing in society, I'd like to get a little more detailed on these two approaches of sexuality, okay? So we're gonna transition now to a deeper dive. We're gonna explore the origins and the outcomes of these ideas as they're presented by three advocates on each side, the traditional side and the postmodern side, all right? So on the postmodern side, the three advocates were Alfred Kinsey, Hugh Hefner, and Herbert Marcuse. On the traditional side, there's Moses, Jesus, and Paul, okay? How's that for a a three-on-three cage match, all right? So in short, we have a pervert, a playboy, and a commie facing off against a prophet, a savior, and an apostle. Let's get it on. Let's see whose ideas are better for people and for society as a whole. So let's get into the postmodern view of sex. And here we have Mark, here we have Alfred Kinsey. Everyone, of course, recognizes Hugh Hefner. And then this guy, nobody knows who he is. This is Herbert Marcuse, one of the most influential philosophers of the latter half of the 20th century. So let's start with Kinsey. He's the pervert. Kinsey was a zoologist at Indiana University. He was a bisexual and he practiced an open marriage with his wife. And he shocked the nation in 1948 when he published his blockbuster book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, 
followed in 1953 by sexual behavior in the human female. His research paved the superhighway for the sexual revolution. He based his findings on extensive interview research, which he conducted over a number of decades to, to, to discover what he saw was the actual sexual experiences and practices of Americans. To get behind the happy talk and to get down to the gritty reality, all right? And Kinsey, Dr. Kinsey summarized his findings. 85% of the total male population has premarital intercourse. This is back in 1948. Nearly 70% of men in America have had relations with prostitutes. Upward of 45% of men in America in the 1940s were having extramarital intercourse. 37% had some homosexual experience. 17% of those raised on farms have had animal intercourse. Persons involved in these activities taken as a whole constitute more than 95% of the total male population of America. So Kinsey's basic argument was that the prevalence of these sexual experiences proved that traditional moral structures weren't working, okay? They're just totally ineffective. And the fact that many of these sexual practices were banned in law in most jurisdictions in America at the time meant that most of the American men that you were bumping into on the street or in your home were unconvicted sex criminals. So Kinsey called for a radical reevaluation of American sexual mores and law. And he got it, didn't he? Now, do those numbers seem high to you? If you're thinking, yeah, that seems a little high, well, I think you're on to something, okay? Because subsequent research, decades later, it took decades, revealed that Kinsey's research was flawed by what st statisticians call an invalid sample set, okay? He didn't select his subjects, his human test subjects, his interviewees. He didn't select them randomly, but he sought volunteers which creates a volunteer bias. So the kind of people who wanted to talk with a researcher about these things, maybe not representative of the general population, right? In addition, on subsequent review of his research, it revealed that prisoners and prostitutes and homosexual men were vastly overrepresented in his sample than they were in the general population. So although they were in no way representative of the general population, Kinsey's research treated them as if they were. He presented this sample set as representative of the population. And the media and academia largely went along with that. They ignored the, the, the invalid sample set and they published the results of his research at face value, okay? Of course, the media and academia would never lie now, would they? No. All right, Kinsey's research was also flawed in its exper experimental methodology, okay? Let me explain that. It included actual observation of and participation in, by researchers, a wide range of sexual activity between researchers and test subjects, often while the camera was rolling. So the researchers were personally involved in the sexual research that they were conducting with their human test subjects. Most notoriously, Kinsey wrote about pre-adolescent 
sexual experience using data gathered by him and others, other adults, in experiments conducted with over 300 children aged from two months to 15 years. This was pedophilia masquerading as the science. Okay? Though he presented all of his findings with sterile clinical detachment, you know, that tone of writing, clearly his research was driven, at least in part, by his own sexual desires and needs. His research methodology appears ideally suited to arrive at the conclusions that he sought, which isn't science, it is advocacy, it is fraud, all right? So that's the pervert, Alfred Kinsey, the father, the father of the American sexual revolution. Let's turn now to his most prominent disciple. We turn now to the playboy, Hugh Hefner, the Hef. In a Crossfire interview in 1966, it's great to watch on YouTube, William F. Buckley introduced Hugh Hefner. Mr. Hefner's magazine is most widely known for its total exposure of the female nude. Though, of course, other things happen in its pages, like the articles, right? And one of those other things included a series of editorial essays written by Hugh Hefner and others from December 1962 through May of 1965 called The Playboy Philosophy, a series of articles called The Playboy Philosophy, which built explicitly on Alfred Kinsey's research. The Playboy philosophy was against what Hefner called suppressive American Puritanism, okay? This is what he saw as the, what he called the anti-sexual aspects of the Christian faith, like forbidding sex outside of marriage. He said this code was arbitrary, it was unnatural, and it was just uptight. <laughs> and so people need to lighten up about sex because it's not sacred or sinful, it's just a natural desire. It's a, an appetite at every bit as natural as hunger or thirst. To refuse your sexual desire is to engage in a destructive form of repression. And that anxiety just isn't good for anybody. It actually increases, he argued, sexual deviancy. So the more you repress, the more deviant you become. Now, the Playboy philosophy was against all that, but it was for what he called a new morality. He said, we are more apt to have a truly monogamous society if we reevaluate the traditional code. And by reevaluate, he meant replace that old legalism with a more humane morality, that is, what he was seeking was a, a morality that is reasonable, realistic, and secular. Okay, let's look at each of those three real quick. It needs to be reasonable, it needs to be reasonable because thou shalt not just isn't reasonable. Uh, we need to evolve a sexual ethic that deals with individuals in different situations in which they live. People can make up their own minds about what is good for them. They don't need to have it told to them by others. Uh, and, you know, arbitrary rules that are made to apply to all people in all situations. All right? So you wanted something that was flexible, reasonable. It also needs to be realistic because Kinsey showed that thou shalt not is just not realistic, right? Everyone's doing it. So why not just do it too? See, Kinsey says it's natural. And with new technologies like the pill and cures for venereal diseases and abortion, 
The whole motivational equation behind sex and pregnancy has completely changed. So there's no longer any reason to restrict it to the safety of marriage. All right? That's realistic for modern people. It also needs to be secular because thou shalt not does not apply to non-Christians out there. All right? So in 1966, he was one of the first people on the public stage who was talking about the wall of separation that has become like enshrined dogma in the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution's Establishment Clause. He was one of the early adopters of that wall of separation language between church and state. Christian morality, this traditional stuff, is just private. It has no authority outside an individual's religious life, their decisions, in a larger secular society. The only authority out there in the world that applies to everyone is reason and research. And Heff asserted that reason and research now, given Kinsey, uh, that these are entirely on the side of sexual revolution. So Playboy magazine became an ideal vehicle to make Kinsey's approach to sex seem hip and intelligent and highly appealing, complete with pictures to get you started. The Playboy magazine was an ideal vehicle to make the Playboy philosophy into the American philosophy of sex that dominates the public sphere today. But it took a third person to make the sexual revolution truly revolutionary in American politics. All right? And that brings us now to the third guy here, the commie, Herbert Marcuse. He was a communist. In contrast to Hefner, who, of course, was a blue-blooded, a red-blooded American entrepreneur and capitalist and libertarian, Marcuse wanted to destroy capitalism and individual freedom and replace it with a new society of collective equality, what today is called equity and fairness. And to get there, he and his colleagues in the Frankfurt School realized that they had to destroy Western culture. And to do that, they had to destroy Christianity. Because in modern, and in modern democracies, the weak point of Christianity was, secular, was, was sexual morality, okay? You subvert sex, and the church's influence would collapse. And so they developed a program that they called cultural terrorism. They called it that, to destroy the sexual morals of churches in our country and the culture as a whole. And for him, this began in 1955, when he published a book called Eros and Civilization. All right, so you can imagine in 1955, this is the first edition cover of the book, you got this, you got this uh, very sexually uh, alluring, provocative image of this woman with her legs exposed, sitting on a motorcycle in black leather with her hair flowing and the flame coming out of the side pipes of the motorcycle. I mean, we're ready to go here, right? In this book, Marcuse crossed Marx with Freud, okay? Freud had argued that civilizations are built by repressing our erotic impulses. Left... <coughs> <coughs> Left unchecked, sexuality produces social chaos. But when, when societies 
control those sexual impulses, then when we defer gratification, we channel those energies into productive enterprises. And Marcuse's response to that was, away with it all. All right? He wanted to destroy the riverbanks that channel the water, and he wanted to let that water flow out and flood the land. And to do that, he brought in Karl Marx. Marcuse was a Marxist, and he rejiggered Marx's formulations for, a, for modern American society. He traded the old Marxist dogma of economic oppression because that stuff just didn't fly with uh, you know, the, these affluent democracies. It never resonated. Um, he traded economic repression into uh, a more general feeling of societal, social repression, which he was betting would resonate with the democracies. So Marcuse and his colleagues likened limits on sexual behavior to Marx's old, you know, controlling the means of production. That limits on sexual behaviors are instruments of oppression and conformity that perpetuate the power of the ruling class. It's the sexual repression of monogamy. It's the gender repression of, of domestic motherhood. It's more recently the, uh, the, the phobic repression of binary sexual identity, i.e. biological male and femaleness, and so on and on as we see today. So, He taught, Marcuse taught, that political revolution in affluent democracies must start by liberating the libido. Liberate the libido. You got to let it all hang out. This is what he called polymorphous sexuality. Breaking all the sexual taboos, experiencing sexual pleasure in whatever form one finds it. That becomes an act of political liberation that leads to social, political revolution. And this makes Marx very happy. Now, he was taught that back from the 1950s, the mid-1950s. And since that time, think of life today in 2021. Don't we see all the signs of this liberation all around us? From the predatory behavior of the Weinsteins and the Kevin Spaceys, the politically correct speech codes and trigger warnings on campuses and schools, the millennials, the first generation that is systematically raised on a diet of expressive individualism, an environment of Marcusean sexual revolution. They're amazingly tolerant of ever-evolving polymorphous sexuality, and yet they are startlingly intolerant of your right to question it. Freud was right. Unchecked erotic impulse generates chaos. Marcuse was right. Chaos leads to revolution and increasing repressive power for Marxists. And we are living, I believe, in the advanced stages of that revolutionary effort. And in the next session, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll explore some alternatives. So at this point, I'm open to questions. Okay? All right?
All right, we'll move along to the traditional vision of sex. Yes. Yeah, so Tim just asked, um, we see all this going on in society, and how does it work itself out in the churches that we're part of? And, you know, of course, it's a very different picture in different church traditions. Um, You know, I think in the Roman Catholic Church, we see probably the most clarity and intellectual firepower being applied in a systematic and disciplined way Um, and not just teaching but also uh, praxis as well um, among Roman Catholic churches worldwide. Uh, I think I think in my experience my study the Roman Catholic Church has done the best job of articulating Uh, full-orbed, deep and broad uh, systems of doctrine and teaching and moral instruction uh, and have done, I think, a a commendable job, which has made them very controversial, um, of of holding to those ideas at the parish level um, of anybody in the Christian world. of course, in, in, in Protestantism, you have, you know, a vast array of different approaches, and typically, you know, the way things kind of have coalesced in the last century or so, you have kind of evangelical Protestants, and you have the mainline Protestants. Uh, evangelical Protestants, by and large, have done a pretty good job of maintaining uh, a standard teaching. Uh, but again, with a lot of variety on on different issues that are, you know, that touch on sexuality, um, there's there's been far less coherence there compared to Roman Catholic, and then of course over in the mainline denominations, you know, as an Episcopalian, uh, in the last 20 years, we have seen a dramatic. R- Revolution, where in the Episcopal Church, the Diocese of Virginia, of which I am a part, uh, a full, uncritical, in my opinion, uncritical embrace of the core ideas, core assumptions, um, and in many cases, the praxis of the sexual revolution. And every time the goalposts move, uh, you see a, a, a large segment of the Episcopal Church. It's not just Episcopal, it's Methodists and Lutherans and uh, Church of Christ, um, mainline Baptists and Presbyterians as well, um, moving, eager to move as quickly as possible to keep up with the changes in society. Um, I think that in the decades ahead, I. I wouldn't be surprised if that becomes the biggest difference between Christian communions is where they stand on the sexual revolution. It is a uh, extremely divisive issue and I can't tell you how many Episcopalians are Roman Catholics by background who left the Roman Catholic Church because of its teaching on sexuality, where it, you know, on a number of different issues. Yeah. All right. Good question. Thanks. All right. Okay, so uh, having looked at this uh, postmodern view of sex, the expressive individual approach. Let's now uh, focus on the traditional view of of sex, the Judeo-Christian, 
All right? And here we have, here we're, we're moving away from Marx, laughing at us here. We're moving over to the prophet, the savior, and the apostle. Okay? Let's begin with the prophet. Dear old Moses, he revealed in the pages of Scripture a unique way of looking at God and human beings. This is what what you read in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 is unique. It's a new creation. It's coming out of nowhere in human consciousness in the ancient world, ancient Near East. We find in Genesis, in the beginning, that God made human beings in his image. Again, a new thought for human beings. And God is a community of beings. You see there in Genesis 1 and 2, God said, let us create. Okay? You see a father, a son, and the Holy Spirit all working together to make everything that is. These three distinct persons share a relationship together that is so intimate, so entirely self-giving that the three are one. And that's why the Bible says, at the end of the Bible, God is love. All right? And this is where love, love finds its deepest meaning, the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this image of the divine community is expressed in human community, particularly in the community of a husband and wife. The two being distinct and equal and complementary become one together. As Genesis 2.24 says, the two shall become one flesh. Oh, baby. And it's the transcendent connection between this union and this union, between husband and wife and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that is deep within our nature as human beings made in the image of God that makes sex so fantastic, so compelling, so desirable and powerful. It's the most powerful thing. It goes beyond, I think, the pleasurable sensations that one might feel in their bodies. It connects us to our true identity in God's image. And I think ultimately, that's what every human being is after. You know, Mick Jagger says, I can't get no satisfaction. He certainly tried and tried and tried everything else. I think ultimately what we're after is an ecstatic union with God. And sex embodies that union, which is expressed in the image of God, the unity within the divine community that a husband and wife share together. And through this union, men and women participate in God's work of creation. All right, God blessed the man and the woman. He told them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the world, and subdue it. Making babies, one person at a time. Fill the earth. In God's good intention, sex makes babies. Yeah. And the bond covenant of marriage was made to raise them in the care of mom and dad. God made a masterpiece here. Okay? And every other way of doing sex, all the polymorphous ways, fall short and they disorder what is God's fabulous gift of the union of a husband and wife, okay? That's the foundation for everything in the Bible. 
It's a simple story that shows us what is true and good, what is beautiful and right. And to follow Jesus, you and I have to build our lives on that foundation. Okay? So the Apostle Paul shows us how to build on it. So now we move to this guy. He shows us how to build on the foundation that Moses lay. That's what Paul is helping the Corinthians to do in his first letter to Corinth in chapter 6, verses 9 through 20. And we're just going to go there now. All right. We're going to go to Corinth. Paul wants those Christians in Corinth to see sex through new eyes because their experience of sex has become so deeply disordered. You see, they live in Corinth, after all, okay? It's a city who, in the ancient world, its name became a verb, synonymous with promiscuity. They would say, to Corinthianize, all right? Which meant to have some debased form of sexual intercourse. Corinthian eyes. This is a city that worshipped Aphrodite. Here she is. She's ready to go. Aphrodite was the goddess of love, from whom we get the term aphrodisiac, right? Right, so the, the people of Corinth, they literally idolized sex. And in Corinth, here's the, uh, here's the temple to Aphrodite, the remains of it. The, uh, the temple prostitutes came out into the city to share the, uh, let's just call them the sacraments of Aphrodite. To Corinthianize with the city. And American society is not that bad by any stretch, but, well... Sure do seem to be on our way, yeah? So Paul is writing to these Christians in Corinth, struggling to live with God's vision of sex in a world that was deeply hostile to what they believed and were trying to practice. Does that sound familiar at all? Yeah. These Christians were under enormous pressure. They faced enormous temptation to just go with the flow, to adapt the disordered sexual values of the culture. And for new converts to Christian faith in Corinth, it was a really hard sell to adapt themselves to monogamous sexual expression. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? Yes. So Paul's working really hard, and he's taking big risks in Corinth to inspire and to equip these followers of Jesus to be faithful in their sexual lives. And part of that means engaging the bad ideas that ruled their world and their minds and their libidos. So Paul does that. He, he, he's bursting bad ideas. So let's now turn to what he said here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul is taking on the conventional wisdom in Corinth. He's, he's confronting the prevalent bad ideas about sex that his Christian audience held. Okay? People were saying here in verse 12... See Paul's quotes here? People were saying, hey, all things are lawful for me, baby. They had, an ex they had this expansive view of human freedom in which a variety of one's sexual expressions was inconsequential. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter what I do sexually. Sound familiar? But Paul says, yeah, yeah, but... Uh, but 
Don't let your freedom become a vice that controls you and shapes your identity. People were also saying down here in verse 13, food is meant for the body, for the stomach, and the stomach for food. Basically saying uh, that sex is just an appetite to be satisfied. When hungry, eat. When horny, hook up. Yes, this is very familiar, isn't it? But Paul says your body is not your personal plaything for pursuit of lifestyle choices and appetites. You, you, Paul is saying you don't make the rules, Justice Kennedy notwithstanding, all right? You don't make the rules. And when we break the rules, Paul warns that there are consequences. And we've certainly seen that in our world today, haven't we? Hefner expressed his faith in sexual liberation, that it would lead to what he called a truer form of monogamy. And in that William F. Buckley interview I alluded to earlier, Buckley says, well, how the hell do you know which is an excellent question. And the fact is, is that he didn't know. He had a utopian faith that he believed in faith alone. He, I mean, he believed that it would on faith, pure faith alone. But 50 years later, well, we see the consequences, don't we? We know about the 59 million people and counting who were killed in the womb since then. We know about the emotional trauma suffered by most of their mothers. We know about countless divorces that have occurred since then. The growth of the divorce rate has been steep. And we know about the children raised in single-parent homes. The statistics bear eloquent, and damning, and uniform witness to the fact that life outcomes are worse for children raised in single-parent homes. We know about the spread of sexually transmitted diseases, most of which are now drug-resistant and they've never been more widespread. You never hear about STDs in the media today, but they have never been more widespread in, as they are now. We know about the loss of innocence of our children. It's really quite heartbreaking. We know about the scourge of sexual harassment, rape culture on campus, the empowerment of predators like Bill Clinton, Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey, and so many others, even some within the churches. And these are just the tip of an iceberg that is tearing the hull out of our society. Did you catch the Titanic reference there? Yeah. Now we know about the debasement of our culture. As the sexual genie is let out of the bottle, and now dominates the public square. Sex is everywhere. And now we know about the deluge of pornography that started with Playboy, but it certainly did not end with Playboy. Speaking of pornography, let's just go off on a little bit here on the side. Um, porn sites on the internet now get more visitors every month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. And the effects are quite damaging. There's a lot of studies on this. In a study of U.S. college men, researchers found that 83% report see, reported uh, using mainstream pornography online. And that those who did are more likely to say that they would commit rape or sexual assault if they knew they couldn't be caught. 
and, the, and they were less likely to intervene if they observed a sexual assault taking place. And of course, recently reported uh, assault on a train in New Jersey just uh, within the last month where other passengers recorded a rape happening in their presence with their phones rather than intervening to rescue the woman being assaulted. A 2012 study of college-age women with male partners who use porn concluded that young women suffered diminished self-esteem, relationship quality, and sexual satisfaction correlated with the degree of their partner's pornography use. So if you're a woman and your man is using pornography, it's hurting you in those ways. It's been documented and researched. And now we know about Hugh Hefner's life too, right? He, he promised America happy monogamy, but did he ever live it? No, he had five marriages interspersed with multiple live-in girlfriends, 16 in number. And though, you know, a lot of guys might chuckle and wink and, you know, uh, imagine admiring half and his uh, access to beautiful women. Is this the face of a man living the good life? <laughs> really? You think? No. This is an artificial life there in the Playboy Mansion where human beings are nothing more than the sum of their appearance and their appetites and their attainments. It's profoundly dehumanizing. But now we know the human beings were made for something much grander, much more fulfilling, glorious purpose, okay? So we go back to 1 Corinthians 6. Paul says in verse 13, the body is meant for the Lord and the Lord for the body. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. In fact, let's just keep reading. God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not, not, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take a member of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? He's referring to those temple prostitutes there in Corinth. Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? As it is written, the two become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Our bodies are members of Christ. We are one flesh with him. Just think about that. And think of the explicit analogy that Paul is drawing here to sex, okay? Sex between a husband and wife is and has potential to become, for you, a picture of the deepest soul-satisfying ecstasy of our intimate union with Jesus. I mean, that just uh, blows the mind, okay? And Paul is saying that the life that lasts forever, all right, so raise us up by his power, the life that lasts forever is likened to 
a wedding feast, a marital union in which Jesus and the groom, Jesus is the groom and we are the bride. Jesus doesn't just love us in some pale kind of abstract way. Love. No, he is ravished by us. He is deeply attracted to you and to me. And the most rapturous love between a husband and a wife is just a glimpse of the eternal enjoyment of our union with Jesus. It's just astonishing. And this is why sex is so good. It's so desirable. Or it should be. Okay. Now, my old professor, Tim Keller, up there in Redeemer Church in Manhattan, he was a professor of mine at Westminster, he likened sex to a powerful river. Kind of like Freud, a page out of Freud's book, a powerful river flowing through our lives. Now, Marcuse wanted to breach and destroy the riverbanks that hold the river in. But Christians believe that it's good when the river flows swiftly in our lives. We want that libido. We want that sexual energy. But it's dangerous when it overflows the bounds. All right. So this is a bound flow of rapid water. And we want it to stay within the riverbanks. With all its energy. And what are these riverbanks? The first riverbank, let's just call it the west coast of the river, or the right coast of the river, <coughs> is commitment. There's no sex in Paul's teaching, in the Bible's teaching, there's no sex without commitment, okay? So Paul asks here in verse 15, Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Why? Because there's nothing that keeps us bound to that person. Paul's talking about fornication here. He's talking about adultery. He's talking about sex outside of a whole life commitment in marriage. Okay? And he names... These things, fornication and adultery, along with idolatry, so flee sexual immorality. Um, he names them alongside idolatry and homosexuality, theft, drunkenness, as behaviors that ensnare people in a lifestyle that draws us from the love of God. Ultimately, lives that are um, invested single-mindedly in these behaviors cannot be heirs of God's kingdom because these behaviors are more compelling to us than the reign of Jesus Christ. We choose them over him, and that just doesn't turn out well in the end. So God made sex as the way to give yourself completely to your spouse. Tim, call, Tim Keller calls it an act of radical self-donation. I am yours. And the two become one flesh. It is a physical union binding two people, body and soul, into a whole new life together. But if you have sex promiscuously, without that whole life marital commitment, what are you doing? You're tearing body from soul. You say, baby, I want your body. But that's it. The rest of you, well, you got to go, you, you know, in the morning I want you out of here. But tonight I want your body. You're tearing body from soul. And Tim Keller compares this to a horror movie 
where you see a zombie and the arm is torn off, the skull is split open, the brains are falling out. That's how God sees us. This is what we do to each other when we have sex without marital commitment. We're sundering body from soul. It's a deeply disintegrating experience for the human being. That person's not whole. You turn away. Ew, horror. It's a monstrosity. Or in biblical imagery, biblical language, it's an abomination. You see how that works? It distorts. It disorders. It debases the dignity that we have as creatures made in God's image. And our culture has become a soul-destroying industrial complex, priming people for chaos and revolution and ultimately socialist control for a Marxist revolution. I remember years ago when Britney Spears was everybody's little sweetheart. She's been in the news recently with her protective order where her her father has controlled all the decisions that she made into her 30s. But remember back when Britney Spears was an innocent sweetheart, an icon of innocence and beauty? That was the case until she lost her virginity in public, all right? And just as a quick aside, you notice how our entertainment culture raises up sweet, beautiful girls like Britney Spears, like Lindsay Lohan, like Miley Cyrus, and transforms them into icons of a whore. It's just the most horrible, debasing, dehumanizing thing. Well, Us Magazine, I remember seeing this on a newsstand in 7-Eleven years ago. I saw Britney Spears and something about virginity, and I had to, had to find out what that was talking about. And I read, I bought the magazine. It said, though she vowed to remain a virgin until marriage, she finally admitted to having sex with just Justin Timberlake. Oh, be still my heart, Justin Timberlake. Sex with Justin Timberlake. Britney Spears said, I thought Justin was the one, but I was wrong. She wanted sex as God intended, but she settled for Justin Timberlake. And she experienced the result. The disintegration of body and soul in a very deep and painful way. Britney Spears said that her split from Justin Timberlake was the most painful thing I ever experienced. And that same heartbreaking story has been true of so many boys and girls, young men and women in our society today. I know the story in my own life and experience, my own body and broken heart. Unfortunately, we have lived the story. And it's so easy to become jaded and insensitive as though this were just a normal part of life. Now, contra Kinsey, it's not normal. It was never meant to be. And for many in Western society before the sexual revolution, it was not true. God gave sex as an ecstatic union between a man and a woman committed to each other in marriage. So that's the first riverbank is commitment. The second riverbank is compliment. No sex without compliment. And I don't mean you look beautiful in that dress, darling. All right? We're talking about complementarity. Because sex is like a powerful river flowing through our lives and God intends that it be shared within a lifelong commitment between two people with complementary natures. 
two people of the opposite sex. Okay? That's why Paul, up in verse 9 of his writing to Corinth, includes homosexuality along with fornication and adultery as examples of disordered behavior. Okay, so we've seen the sexually immoral, adulterers, and those who practice homosexuality. Examples of disordered sexual behaviors. Because God intended sex to create an interlocking fit between two very different, men and women, different, between two very different and yet complementary natures of a man and a woman. Like yin and yang, the opposites fit together. Opposite fit. Their male and female bodies fitting together in a perfect physical interlock. Yes, yes, oh baby. And that physical interlock mirrors a deeper interlocking of male and female hearts and minds as well, which are deeply and mysteriously different uh and yet profoundly complementary when we can hold them together. But sex between men or between women, however lovingly shared, It lacks that complementarity, the deep interlock of a male and female nature along with bodies. So God's purpose in sex and marriage is for a man and a woman to complete each other. To find that completion, we need someone who is distinctly other than ourselves rather than one who is fundamentally the same. Human communities around the world and through history, though often lacking the revelation of the Bible to guide them in this regard, nevertheless, typically bear witness to this reality, though often allowing the practice of homosexual activity in societies, pagans, non-Christians, non-Jews, they never have elevated homosexual unions to the same status as or to seem interchangeable with marriages between men and women. Ours is the first society in human history to do that on any kind of scale. So in God's inalienable ordering, we are complemented and completed by the opposite gender in the paired polarity, in the deep physical and psychological interlock, the mysterious union of a husband and wife. Sex between same genders falls short of God's created design, and falling short is the definition of what? The word, the biblical word, sin. Okay? That's the Bible's teaching. Now, Hefner, Hugh Hefner, says that all of this teaching, based on God's revelation, Moses, Paul, Jesus, we haven't gotten to Jesus yet, is, he, he's, he says all of it is um, arbitrary and irrational and inhumane. Little more than thou shalt not. Is he right? I suppose at times Christians have given that impression. You know, it's a lot easier to, it's easy for Christians to lead with a thou shalt not prohibition and to kind of wag their finger and point their finger and, you know, make dirty, you know, mean faces at people who fall short. But can you see the reason behind the rule, thou shalt not commit adultery? Can you see the inner rationale? 
Is there anything that I have said tonight about this that's been arbitrary or inhumane? Can you see how this is not only intended, but it is also well designed for human flourishing and families and society? Can you see how our experiment, our 50 to 70 year experiment in polymorphous sexuality has vindicated that claim? Yeah. So let's, uh, having made that case, let's transition here from the societal issue of sex to the personal issue of sex, all right? And here we come to the Savior. Hello, Jesus. It is so good to know Jesus. We come to the Savior because Jesus empowers us to ride that river flowing between the, the, the river banks flowing through our lives. Now, maybe that river is running smoothly on its course in your life, giving life and joy to you and your spouse. God bless you. It's a true gift, isn't it? Um, but let me just give you a little ad a little uh, exhortation to not forget to tend those riverbanks because complacency is a real threat to great sexual intimacy. It's surprisingly easy to end up in trouble. Or maybe for you, the river is overflowing its bounds. Maybe your sex life has become disordered or out of control, unfaithful to God's intention. You're crossing boundaries. Maybe your heart is leading you to places that you know you shouldn't go. Maybe sex has come to define your identity. Well, you know what? God bless you too. Because we all fall short of God's design and way of life. Or maybe for you the river has dried up. You, w you wonder where the water went. For all of us, there is hope for change. Now Paul listed some ways in which people get trapped in disordered behavior. I'm going back to 1 Corinthians. He says in verse 11, he says, and such were some of you. Okay? But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit coming into our lives to transform us. That's what it's all about baptism. <laughs> all right? Paul is saying that your experience of Jesus Christ has empowered you, Corinthian Christians, to be healed, to be cleansed, to repent, to change, to rediscover what sex was meant to be in your life. And Jesus shows how that starts, how that change starts with the woman caught in adultery who was brought to him there for judgment in John chapter 8, the first 11 verses. You see in Jesus' handling of that, that woman who is guilty, who is shamed, who is shunned, who is in fear for her life, how Jesus 
accepted her in her brokenness, how he forgave her what she had done. and protected her from the wrath of others. But Jesus didn't leave it at that. No, Jesus also aimed to change her, to, to, ta- to take her from where she was to where she would be, what she would become. He said, I don't condemn you. So go Let's go and sin no more, okay? See, Jesus helps us see what life can be like, liberated from disordered sexual behavior, centered, ultimately satisfied in the deepest places of our heart and our body by his loving gaze, being eye to eye with the guy, just like the woman caught in adultery was, was he, as he brought her up from the dirt and gazed into her eyes. This is what you and I and everyone we know is looking for in life. This is what we need more than anything else. We get this and everything else begins to fall in place. Intimacy with our God is our deepest need and it often goes unmet in our restless searching for love and approval through sexual activity, right? We're looking for love in all the wrong places, and our society is too. People's issues with sexual self-control and disordered affections, people's dissatisfaction and hunger in life are ultimately driven by this gnawing hunger at the center of our being. It's a hunger for intimacy with God, and it can be satisfied. Jesus showed the woman caught in adultery how it is satisfied. Paul taught the Corinthians that the deeper that you experience Jesus' affection for you, the more control you'll have over your sexual impulse, the more satisfying your sexual life will be. And I pray that each of us will experience that as well. That's my goal in this talk. Thank you for your time. Good. All right, so the question is, uh, given the pressure that we are under by our society, how to counsel uh, young Christian men and women, college students, people in their 20s, teenagers, 20s, 30s, um, to to live with singleness uh, and to remain sexually pure? Um, I would counsel, as Paul did, (laughs) dealing with a very similar situation, um, to see the glory of intimacy with God and the need to uh, protect uh, our sexual intimacy within the bonds of marriage by... um, marrying and you know I think there's a huge trend these days to waiting to marry until you're in your late 20s your 30s and later Um, I think at at the end of the day Christians have to maintain our vision of sex as something that is shared and protected within marriage within that commitment And ultimately, we can get there. I know I did. I married at age 27, um, became a Christian at age 19, and uh, from 19 until 27 was, uh, you know, for me, 
sexual purity was one of my strongest goals and biggest struggles. And, uh, and ultimately what I found is that the teaching that I presented tonight and being in, in strong Christian community uh, and, and, and basically a, uh, a deep experience of God on a, you know, through spiritual disciplines that they got me there to my wedding. Great. So premarital sex is so prevalent in our society that people are engaging in sex at younger and younger age. What is your view of how we can rescue the next generation and recover the biblical view of sex? <clears throat> how do you rescue the next generation? Um, I would say that a lot of churches, well, let's go back to one of the first things I said tonight was everybody's talking about sex in society, but we rarely talk about it in, in public in the churches, is my experience, my observation. And I think that is part of the problem that we're having with sexual purity, with teenagers, teenage Christians experimenting sexually, um, and, and Christians in their 20s and 30s uh, not waiting for marriage, delaying marriage, but not sexual uh, 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 experimentation and, and sharing. Um, they de delay marriage, but not sex. Um, and I think a lot of Christian formation and teaching would help rescue these generations. And I'll speak from my own experience, raised nominally Episcopalian and sexually um, awakened at a young age. And you know, a large part of my life as a as a young man, as a teen in my in my teens, and uh, into college, was seeking sexual gratification. And for me, becoming a follower of Jesus, explicitly involved, uh, recognizing that and repenting of it, and uh, I was rescued by loving, clear teaching uh, with a lot of social support from my friends in Christian community. Um, I was rescued from that by good, clear teaching and a lot of loving support. All right, so the question is, <coughs> given the statistics that I cited on, and, and I just, you know, just a few little bits, um, what do we do about porn as Christians? And one of the most disturbing things about statistics on pornography is that Christians, those who profess to be Christians, that respond in surveys, that, checking the Christian box, that uh, porn habits are a little different among this group and the rest of society. And, you know, that is a, uh, that is a terrifying fact, and it is totally out of control, and I have no idea what to do about it other than to name it and to um, to inspire and equip people to seek other things, to, when tempted, make better choices. And ultimately, 
that battle is won in each individual heart, in each individual moment of temptation. Um, it, it is won or lost eye to eye with the guy where we, have, where we are able in that quiet, private, secret moment to turn to Jesus and um, receive his love, receive his affirmation, receive intimacy with him as an alternative. What does the Bible have to say about this drift within the body of Christ toward increasing acceptance of sexual promiscuity? Um, you know, the first thing I think of is, well, 1 Corinthians 6. So Paul is dealing with these same issues there in the city of Corinth and the churches that were spread around Corinth. And evidently, by the fact that Paul is addressing it at such length, not only here but elsewhere in the book of First and Second books of First and Second Corinthians, that uh, it was a very widespread, deeply rooted problem within those Christian communities, and Paul is strenuously um, working against that. And so, what does the Bible say about it? I think we could see uh, on the face of it that, well, it's. It is what it is, and it is a reality then and now. So I don't think we should be shocked. I don't think we should be, uh, you know, think that we're in some uniquely bad situation because I think it's probably worse, what Paul is addressing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and elsewhere, worse then, there, than it is here now. In most instances among the churches, I would... I would have to, I would conclude that. I, I, I feel on safe ground in saying that. Um, the next place I go is to uh, the letters to the churches in Revelation, where we see uh, Jesus confronting the bishops of those churches in very explicit terms, uh, in, in a couple of cases like Thyatira, um, where you all embrace Jezebel. You know, there's this, you know, I don't think Jezebel is far off from Aphrodite um, as a biblical icon of sexual license. And, um, and, and, the, uh, and Jesus speaks in extremely explicit terms there of how they fell into that, the cost of that, and also of hope for uh, uh, extricating themselves from it. And so there's, there's all three of those, right? Explicit reality, uh, explicit confrontation, explicit hope. You see, turning to the Old Testament, what does the Bible say about this? You look at uh, how, how the prophets before the exile, pre-exilic prophets, dealt with Israel's unfaithfulness, and they likened the idolatry of the people of Israel, particularly oftentimes the ruling class of Israel, in explicit, very uh, explicit uh, terms of adultery and sexual license. And those two often go together. And, you know, I think... What does the Bible say? It says, well, uh, meet the, you know, here we go again. And uh, there's nothing new under the sun. And, you know, we got to confront and deal with this in a forceful and clear way. And uh, with loving support uh, and, you know, in Christian community, there is hope for 
repentance, restoration, accountability, and growth, uh, because at the heart of the Christian faith is Jesus raising the woman caught in adultery. She's guilty as, as hell, raising her out of the dirt just before the rocks start flying, and there he is loving this woman and restoring her and saying, I don't condemn you. Let's now go and sin no more, all right? That's a very powerful combination. So I have a lot of hope for uh, the dynamism of grace in Christian community, even in the unprecedented sexual hellhole of American churches. So that's the end of the questions and good questions. I appreciate you all asking and hearing and your time coming out tonight. Thank you, Tim, for organizing this. And uh, Mary and Simon, uh, great to have you on the other end of this lens. And thank you for bringing your Toronto group. And uh, I just want to say God bless you all and thank you for joining us tonight. Good night. And that is going to, I need to text Josh. Josh, who ran this whole thing remotely from his apartment. So cool. I have not yet. It's sitting on my kitchen counter, which is, you know, that's, that's a place to, to remind me. So I see it every day. It's, uh, it's not appropriate. No. But he talks about a lot that you cover Yes. You know, I should probably read that book before.